Cool. So Simon, can you just give me a really quick overview of what it is that you actually do? So what I try and do is to take behavioral finance. So the psychology of financial decision-making, all the research related to that and say, how do you use it? How do you use it if you're a financial advisor? How do you use it if you're an investment manager? How do you use it as a super fund? How do you use it as a company? That's it in a nutshell. Well, and what, what is behavioral finance? Like for those that don't know. Yeah, I think people probably have come across aspects of psychology before, what's driving people to do things, to behave in certain ways, to make certain decisions. And then they might have come across a thing called behavioral economics, which is that we then start to use these to say, well, how do we nudge people to, I don't know, to lose weight or to exercise more or to pay off their credit card. So there's all this, those sorts of things use less energy, all right, that's behavioral economics. And then behavioral finance is like that, but it's a, the extension into specifically investment financial decisions. How does it relate to markets? How does it relate to whether you save for retirement versus spend and splurge now? Do you have insurance? Do you, how do you build portfolios? All that sort of stuff. How on earth did you get into that? Where does that come from? Uh, well, it depends how far back you want to go. Let's so, go right back. <laughs> <laughs> right I want back. to know okay. where this came from. <laughs> okay. So if you go back, my father and my uncle and I think my aunt, anyway, it, they're, they're all PhDs in psychology, professors of psychology. All right. So now you could say, was I influenced by all those people who were down that sort of path anyway? Did I have the same genes as them? And somehow we were influenced in that way. <clears throat> Did I make completely independent choices? Maybe. I don't know. It's hard to say. But I went to university. What did I study? Well, I studied psychology. I chose a range of subjects, chose psychology, enjoyed psychology, ended up doing a degree majoring in psychology. Then do I want to become a psychologist? Not really. I don't like listening to people's problems, to be honest. <laughs> so no, I don't want to be a psychologist. So I didn't end up going into psychology, went down a path of finance investments, and then ultimately ended up going, well, actually, why don't I bring these two things together? And that now is the field of behavioral finance didn't really exist back when I studied at the university, but now it does. And so here it is. So when you're at school and, you know, in those latter years when you've got to choose your subjects, because, you know, if you need to get into university, were you quite clear that this is what you wanted to do back then? Hell no. No, not at all. So I chose an arts degree because it just allowed me to try whatever I wanted. So I chose psychology from the Department of Social Sciences. I chose philosophy from the, the arts faculty. I chose economics and commerce subjects from the fac faculties of economics and commerce. I chose maths and statistics from the maths and engineering department. So I had quite a range in that. And how far did I go with my philosophy? I studied one semester. <laughs> how far did I go with economics? Well, actually, you know, I went, went a couple of years through economics. How far did I go with psychology? Well, I went through to at least an undergraduate degree before going off and doing law and doing commerce and other investment sort of subjects. So you like study, <laughs> sounds like. Yeah, I've done a fair amount of it now, but um, I'm still at a deficit to all the PhDs and <laughs> doctorates in, in my immediate family, unfortunately. Oh, I think that's gorgeous. So is a PhD on your cards or not? No, 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 no PhD for me. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no I, I love that. <laughs> um, so given that you are in the whole space of behavioural finance and obviously psychology is a big part of it, one thing I'm fascinated by is value. So when I say the word value, what comes up for you? Like how do you define it? What does it mean? How would you explain it? No limits to how you want to answer this. Yeah, so I would put, I struggled actually when you put that question to me the other day and I was thinking, what, what do I think about? And a bunch of things do, and I don't have one specific view. So I reckon I would start with value in monetary terms. So this is sort of a pure rational economic sort of lens. I'd say dollars, all right? Tell me how many dollars you're giving me. That's how much value I ascribe to something. Okay, now in an investments context, well, you might say, yeah, I'm an investment manager or I'm an advisor or something, and I'm going to give you a return that's going to create an extra $10,000 or whatever of retirement savings. Awesome. Is that the value you've created? Okay. Now, to create value, well, it has to be based on the dollars compared with what I otherwise would have done. There's an opportunity cost. What else would I have done? So then we'd have to say, okay, let's compare to a benchmark, which is a whole range of issues. And then we have to adjust for risk because frankly, if you give me a higher return, but I'd have to suffer extra risk, well, that doesn't really add value. You just take an extra risk. 
And what if you've given me extra return, but it's just all completely luck? Well, I could have flipped a coin anyway. That's not value, even though I've got all this extra money. Okay, so there's a whole lot of complexity in even just the dollars. But then, of course, it's not just about dollars. It's then about, well, what am I going to use those dollars for? What does it ultimately translate into? And then that's when all the sort of the, the psychology of the well-being aspects come comes to it. And then you get a whole bunch of, bunch of other questions. So is it, if I, I don't know, buy a bike, what's the value of the bike to me? Well, it's the feeling of the wind through my hair as I, no, well, no, not my hair, someone else's hair. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, the wind through my helmet where my hair should be. Uh, that's the, <laughs> right, so I get, so there's an immediate aspect and you can think of well-being in the immediate versus there's a, 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 a benefit on reflection. Like when I sit back and I think about, oh yeah, I've got this great shiny bike in the, in the garage. And there's a social aspect when I talk to my friend and they go, oh gosh, you got an awesome bike there, Simon. So there's all these different um, sort of, uh, I guess, psychological lenses about what those what those different things are. So it's, I think it's quite murky and yeah, hard to put your finger on it. Would be would be my overall assessment. Oh, uh, and you know what? You're not alone. I've been asking this question, I reckon, for about 15 years, <laughs> and I don't think anyone just answers it succinctly and by definition. And and even listening to you talk about the bike, and I love the comment about the wind through your hair and you know, realistically, maybe it still gives you that sense or that feeling and that's really important. But where do, say, the emotional um, components that you just talked about, where would they override, say, the fact that there's also a cost, a physical, a financial cost to that bike? Like, how do you weigh those up? And, you know, does any of the work in psychology or behavioural finance play a role? Like, have, have you got any clues from all the work you've done that might help people understand you know, what components of value they would give greater weight into at different times? Yeah, I mean, it's what they should do. I mean, there's certainly some evidence about what they should do, right? It's because we can make assessments about what things ultimately lead to various measures of psychological well-being in the future and what things don't. And unfortunately, we're bad at what's called, we may have come across the term effective forecasting. We're bad at forecasting how we're going to feel about things in the future. So we can, we, I guess we can use that to say, here are the things that you should value. And those things tend to be, well, I don't know, things like how you spend your time makes a big difference versus the objects you've got. So, if, well, there's some overlap there. If I have an object that changes the way I spend my time, like you might say skis, if I had skis, well, that's an object and objects don't typically tend to, we habituate to objects, we get used to them. They don't tend to impact us in the longer term. However, skis are an object that can change the way I spend my time and the way you spend your time tends to relate to your overall sense of well-being. So that's looking through to how you spend your time, I think would be one thing. So that the skis is an example, but like buying a house, if I've got the biggest house on the, the best house on the street or whatever, well, there's some sort of social comparison aspect to it. But I should be thinking about things like my commute time. That's how I spend my time. Well, in a pandemic, it doesn't matter because we're all, it's the commute from the bedroom to the kitchen to the, to the, to the study, I guess. But in, in more normal times, it's, it's that sort of stuff. You can look through and say, well, what are those things? They're the things that ultimately I should value. And do people look at it through these lenses typically? Well, I don't know about you, but when you buy a house, do you go, I mean, are you thinking about, well, I guess you probably think about commute time to some extent, that, that sort of thing. But I think people typically look at the things that are more easy to compare. So what's the size of the land? How much do other houses in my in this area go for? How many bedrooms and bathrooms is it got? <laughs> that, that sort of stuff. And they are related to some degree. I mean, if you've got, if you're all crammed into one bedroom, it's going to impact if you've got a family of four or whatever, all in one bed, it's going to impact the way you spend your time. That is true. But are we looking through ultimately to the how we spend our time, how we direct our attention? That's the sort of stuff. Like, like a car is another example. Do I buy a car and I think, I, I, well, I buy a car, I think it's going to make me feel good because, gosh, it's, I've always wanted one of these BMWs and, gosh, it looks great. Oh, I mean, it gets, gets to 100 so quick. All that makes me feel good. But it only makes me feel good when I'm actually driving the car or when I'm thinking about the car. And how much of my day do I spend doing those two things? At this point in time, almost none. <laughs> Frankly, I'm hardly ever spending my car, or spending any time thinking about my car. So it's that, that sort of thing, I guess, we're trying to look through to the underlying sort of psychological issues. And I don't think people do it particularly well, but we can take some rules of thumb about trying to focus on experiences rather than things. But 
as you said, there's a bit, as we talked about, there's a bit of blurriness. Some things lead to experiences and, and the like. Absolutely. And you just alluded to just before some of those examples about, you know, say valuing something into the future and, you know, especially when it comes to things like retirement savings and that. Tell me more about that because I that's something I see play out well that, you know, like just say, for instance, you've got to go on a diet. You go, oh, I won't start today, but I will tomorrow because tomorrow I'm going to be more disciplined than I am today. Yet, of course, tomorrow comes and I'm like, you know, I will. So we seem to, you know, say that I'm going to be a different person or make a different decision in the future to how we do that today. How does that play out from a yeah. behavioural finance point of view? Yeah, well, I think, I think you're right. Generally, it's we do tend to think we're going to have more time and more discipline in the future. We, why don't I do these things today? Well, it's because I'm tired. It's because it's convenient that the ice cream's in the fridge or whatever, or for, for my diet perspective, or, oh, yeah, you know what? I really like these pair of shoes, but tomorrow there won't be a pair of shoes. Yeah. Yeah. Tomorrow there will be a pair of shoes. So you're like tomorrow you'll still be feeling tired, all that sort of stuff. So we sort of don't tend to understand that how the future will look and therefore how we'll be influenced by some of those sort of, those sort of contextual um, issues. We also down tend to downplay the emotions that we feel in the future. So that's that's why some of these sort of for techniques for financial advisor that financial advisors can use or super funds. Any anyone trying to encourage people to save can say, how can we take these emotions that you will feel in the future? This is your future self. This is a version of you, but you feel disconnected from that future self. How can I make that connection feel a bit more tangible? How can I bring those emotions into from the from the future into the present and that's when you get these sort of visioning exercises that say imagine that you're sitting on a beach can you feel the sand in your toes can you smell the salty air who are you there with are you reading a book is it sunny is it warm it's like you're trying to bring all that so I can get a, a more tangible concrete view even if I don't end up spending my retirement on the beach or whatever I mean this can be horses for courses of course but at least I've got a tangible vision of it that allows me to make a connection with that future version of myself and therefore prioritize my future person, my future self's needs. Does it work? Do you think? Uh, well, the evidence suggests that it does improve things. Does it mean that we do all the right things all the time? Certainly not. But it, I mean, the evidence around some of those things, when you put people in simulators, when you give them virtual reality displays that show an aged version of themselves, or you do these visioning exercises. So there's a bunch of things that have been tried. And then when you put people in randomized control trials and do this versus doing some other equivalent thing, that's, that's not sort of bringing forward that future self um, sort of or bringing back into the present, the future self. It does make a difference in terms of their savings intentions and that sort of stuff. Yeah, so that, it does make a difference, not a full difference, I'm sure. Yeah. Do you think it's a, a tactic that a lot of financial professionals use or a lot of professionals use, even though they know about it? Do you think that they, um, one, do they use it and do they do it properly to really get the benefits out of it? Uh, I don't know there is a properly um, at this point because we don't really know. I mean, we've tried a few things, but there's always practical issues like that future's aged version of yourself. That, that's been tried now. It's several years old, um, but the technology's moved on. So those rudimentary versions that we had a few years ago, I don't know if you've tried these, but if you have, yeah, okay. So it's, it's, quite, it's a bit of fun, isn't it? You put yourself in and press the button and, and you look like a horrible, haggard version of yourself. <laughs> of yourself. But they're getting better, so you can sort of interact with them a bit more. That the aging technology now looks a bit more effective. It looks a bit more realistic. So some of these sort of things, the practical issues maybe are going away um, with as the technology improves. But frankly, am I going to go to my super fund? Are they going to have this as a functionality that they're going to provide? Is that a bit too far out there for many funds to be using at this point? Maybe they're not going to use that sort of technology. They should be using at least the language around connecting with your future. So even some of the terminology about it's just it's just you, but you'll be a bit older. Your underlying needs will be that well, the, not maybe your needs. It's it's still fundamentally you. That that sort of wording to try and draw that the um, identity connection, I still identify with this person as still being a version of me. Because when you put people in brain scanners, it's like dealing with a stranger. You probably, have you seen that research as well? Yeah. So if you put someone in a brain scanner and say, think about yourself, right? Parts of your brain light up as you're thinking about yourself. You say, think about a stranger, somebody you don't know, and different parts of your brain light up. And then you say, think about your future self, yourself as a 70 year old. 
what parts of your brain lights up as you're thinking about yourself as a 70 year old? Well, it's more like when you're thinking about a stranger. So saving for this strain, this, this future self is like saving sort of at a neurological level. It's like saving for a stranger. And some of the research suggests that the people who can get that connection, a closer connection between the sort of the brain functions and structures that are used when you think about your future self, well, they're more likely to, to prioritize the future, for example. And how can we get them thinking more that way versus as a stranger? And any any tips from what you've seen over the years that would allow to you know that connection to come more easily? I think yeah, it's so it's fascinating. Yeah, so it's trying to make it the, the identity connection, making it feel like this is a person, a version of me. It's trying to make the, the emotional connection, the, the tangibility connection. And that's, I mean, we've got a problem with the uncertainty of it. So that's when I think about now, there's only one version of me right now. In the future, there's hundreds of thousands of possibilities it's all murky and how can i imagine so even okay fine we don't know what it's going to be but how can i at least make a concrete version of one of those futures that then can allow me to yeah make it tangible make a connection with that future even if that that future is probably not going to play out exactly that way i love that um concept that you know the future me there's so many different identities so many different versions which is kind of cool right because it allows you some choice in which one you want or which path you want to actually head down. Yeah, but I think one of the challenges that I say a super fund or maybe a financial advisor, perhaps to a lesser degree, has got is that they don't know what things I might, I mean, I don't know either, but they they certainly don't know. <laughs> so then they put out a thing that's got a picture of an old man on a golf course. All right, now, do I like golf? Oh, yeah, I don't mind golf. Would I be on that golf course? Well, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. But it's so allowing the the uh, person, I guess, to identify what their future is. But then you're, you're stuck in a position where you might say, no matter what your financial goals are, and so then you're leaving this whole wide sort of aspirate uncertainty, you're leaving it in the hands of the poor person to then. So I think you've got to, we've got to allow people to explore themselves, but help them on that journey rather than sort of leaving it completely sort of wide open, uncertain. I absolutely love that comment. I think when you give people a blank slate, it's so much harder. And one of my favourite um, ways of bringing this to is I often say, so Simon, what do you want for dinner tonight? Lasagna. Oh, so no wonder you answered. <laughs> Most people uh, go blank or go, oh, I don't care or whatever you want. They, they can't answer that question. It's too open-ended. But if I say, do you want chicken or fish? then they either say chicken or fish or they say, oh, no, I want lasagna. It's almost <laughs> like by giving yeah. them at least some <laughs> structure, it mm. allows them to answer far more readily. So, you know, yeah. I love the example you said before, but by even putting someone on a golf course, I'd love your thoughts on this. At least it's some identity as, a, as opposed to just that broad brush, you know, whatever your goals might be for the future. Mm. But I would then imagine, even though I'm not into golf, I hate golf, but... I don't imagine myself a golf, but suddenly I can imagine myself sitting by a pool, for example, reading a book. Mm. But because there's no, whereas when you just leave it open ended, it's too broad. So my brain has no idea on which direction to go. What are your thoughts in that space? Yeah, I don't know if there's a best approach there, but maybe it's providing a couple of options. I mean, I did look at some, I did review a document the other day for a financial advice group, and they had a picture of a couple of people running through the ocean uh, on the front cover of their advice document. And they said, well, it's sort of appealing because many people like that and it looked appealing to me as well from, from that perspective. I'd love to be running through a nice warm ocean. <laughs> There's no ocean in my five kilometre range, unfortunately. I have got one in my range, but it's too damn cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. But, but I mean, it's again a challenge for those people who maybe aren't interested in the ocean or can't swim or whatever it is. And I don't know, maybe it's trying to give people a couple of options that maybe cover a few bases. I don't know, maybe the golf, the ocean and a farm. I, I don't know, maybe there's a few things, but I agree. We've, we've got to find ways to make personally relevant and tangible connections for, for people. Now, I mean, I think the technology helps us get there as well. I mean, if, as tools, you can sometimes get people through like a decision-making tree. What sort of future do you envisage for yourself? Is it this, 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 or this? And then you can go, okay, now you've said it's beach. Do you think you'd be in the water or sitting by the beach reading a book or that you can maybe start, you can maybe sort of help people down some of those sort of paths to get to an outcome that's relevant for them. Oh, I love that. And I, I want to touch on decision-making shortly. Can I just um, jump back to, you made a comment about language 
what role does language play in terms of um, one, what how people see their future, but two, in terms of value? What where, what role do you think language plays overall if you're trying to help people understand value? Um, well, what would I say to that? I, well, I mean. I think the problem with value is it's so vague in many cases. So when things are vague from a decision-making perspective, when things are vague, people often look for simple decision-making shortcuts, ways to cut through the complexity. And those things often have some truth to them, but they're sort of rough rules of thumb. Okay, so what we can do is we can try and align what we do with those rules of thumb. If people are going to use these simple decision-making shortcuts, how can we make sure that if we're communicating with these people that we make the things that we're communicating to them look like they're valuable? Hopefully they are also valuable. <laughs> Let's make sure they are actually valuable as well, but make them look valuable given people are going to be making these simple decision-making shortcuts. So to give you an example, if people are going to say, not, well, sorry, they're not consciously going to say, but this is effectively what's happening behind the scenes, is that if something is, um, if it's difficult, and if a lot of work has gone into it, then I'm going to assume that thing is valuable. Right? They're not, as I say, not consciously thinking that, but that's sort of subconsciously what, what goes on. We use the amount of work that's gone into something as a proxy for its value. Now, of course, you could do a whole lot of work on something and it's complete crap, right? And it's got no value. That's, that's entirely possible. However, as a rough rule of thumb, the more you put into something, the more you get out of it, sort of roughly makes a lot of sense. Okay, so if I'm then communicating, what language do I use and how do I communicate? What I want to make sure is I'm doing the things that make it look like a lot of work's gone in and avoiding the things that make it look like no work has gone in. So what I want to avoid is in my documents, things that say, um, uh, what would be an example? Um, uh, if you have children, then... Um, uh, no, for, for each of your child slash children, then fill out that, that sort of thing. Child slash children is an example. So if I see a document that says, if you have child slash children or words that affect, then it says, A, you don't know how, if I've got a child and B, you don't know if I've got one or more. So it looks like you haven't put any work into understanding me, or if you understand me, you haven't put any work into actually changing the document to reflect my individual circumstance. This looks like a template document that no, no actual person has then tailored to my, for my needs. So every time I'm seeing generic content, I'm thinking little work has gone into this. So I, I want to avoid any language that looks that, looks that way. On the flip side, I want, to, I want to include the language that makes it look like a lot of work has gone in by describing the processes or showing the outputs or including the 25 page appendix that's got all the modeling or whatever it is that's, that's the stuff in there. So that, gosh, look at all this, look how heavy this report. <laughs> okay, fine, you don't wanna make it so hard for people that are not gonna read the report, you put it in an appendix or whatever, but actually the sort of the size and the output is a proxy therefore for how much work has gone in. And if that's what we're using as a proxy for value, a lot of work's gone in, that's how I wanna communicate. I totally, totally agree with you on this. And I was reading something a little while ago and I cannot remember where I was reading it. And that kills me that I can't quote the source because it, it's, um, it was really valuable. But they were saying that when they read a book, so just say it's a 10-chapter book, that most of the, the, the gist of what it is is captured in the first couple of chapters. So they can read the first couple of chapters and quite comfortably feel okay that they don't need to read the rest. But the only reason that they can do that is because the rest is there. The substance is still there. So it allows them to enjoy the simplicity of just the first few chapters because there's the 10 chapters in the substance. Whereas if they'd only read what was in those first three chapters, they might not feel the same level of value has come out of them because they can't see the substance behind it, which, which is almost exactly what you're saying. So we get the benefit of the simplicity with the confidence of the substance and the complexity. Yeah. I mean, I often talk about layering. So that's, I think what you've described is, so, so yeah. I want to, I want to deliver a whole lot of stuff and part of it's, I want to show value, but part of it's maybe I'm, I'm communicating something that's complex and I just, I have to communicate a lot of stuff. Maybe it's a regulatory requirement. I have to disclose all of this stuff because I have to give you a statement of advice. There may be many reasons I have to give you a lot of stuff. Okay, fine, but I want to layer it. So there's a good executive summary so you can get the main points without having to read the 50 pages, all right? And then it's, it's got headings and it's got chapters, sub chapters. And so it's like, so I can, I can easily get the stuff out of it without having to read a thousand pages or whatever it is. 
Um, but it's all there. It demonstrates the value. It demonstrates the work. It's meeting all my regulatory requirements. It's all there. I love that. Absolutely love it. Do you, are there any professions that you think commit this crime more than others? <laughs> Oh, a crime. Um, well, I mean, I, I think to some extent we can't avoid it. So I, I don't want to say these people are necessary criminals because they do it. Uh, but, I mean, it's you look at financial advice. There's a lot of stuff that gets communicated that I'm sure isn't read. Uh, and, but that's not necessarily the advisors because they're often dealing with templates that they can't change. But the people who do the template, make the templates, they maybe could change some of it, but then they've got the regulatory burdens about what they have to put in. And then the regulators saying, well, it's not our fault. It's what the law requires. And then, uh, anyway, so you get this whole cascade of actually who can you blame for that sort of stuff. But we can certainly apply some of the principles about putting executive summaries on the front, making it easier, ordering it in terms of the most important stuff first. So that's financial advice. I mean, I look at super funds similarly. You look at the stuff that goes out to a relatively disengaged member base. Hey, look, there's been an update to the mm, your future, your super rules, and therefore blah, 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 blah. And here's a new PDS and a, whatever the other document. And they don't, they're not interested. And there's all this stuff. And fair enough, the super fund is obliged to communicate that some of that sort of stuff. But they don't have to open the fire hydrant and, <laughs> and thrust it all down people's throats. It, then, it, then it's about then, I guess, that sort of a layering as well. So I, I do think more effort could go into the layering, the way information is presented, even if there are these burdens on some of these regulated parts of the industry that say you have to communicate, communicate this information. They don't necessarily have to communicate it in a way that, that is going to completely disengage the, the members of the, the clients. Oh, I love that. I oh, Something I see all the time. So just on that example, if you were the super fund and you were needing to update clients or members around certain changes, what, what could they do? What could they do differently that's not going to completely, you know, bore the person on the other end? But so that that message does get across or that message of value comes to them that, you know, they are um, very much aware of what's going and what's happening. What could they do? Yeah, so I think there's a few things. I mean, value is part of it. So I, I want my members to, or my clients to value my service. I want them to trust me, for example, but I also want them to some extent to read what I'm giving them. And I also want them to do stuff that's going to help them and that's going to help me. So there's there's a few aspects of that. So what would I be doing? I mean, that's the layering we've talked about. I, I think that another piece of it is the personalization. What I struggle with often in when I'm looking at some of those documents is, what the hell does this mean for me as the individual member? And I think we just came back to that question about language saying, actually putting in what this means for you is, and then fill, filling out the rest of that sentence or what this means for you right now is. Because every now and then I look at the stuff that I get from my super fund and it says, uh, one example was, oh, I, I got this email. I thought, awesome. It's, they've done exactly what I've said. The title was what the budget changes mean for you. I thought, great, what, what do the budget changes mean for me? Awesome, I'm definitely going to read this. Actually, it's not what I thought. I was a bit sceptical, but I, <laughs> anyway, let's, let's go with that. All right, so I go in, what the budget, first thing, did you know, Simon? So I didn't say, did you know, Simon? It's a dear Simon. Um, the budget rules have changed. Now, um, people aged, I forget what it was, 70 to 80 who meet the work test can now contribute extra to superannuation. And I'm like, do you have any idea how a fine, fine, I might look 80 to you, but no, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to put in my diary right now, a little reminder that in 30 years time that I'm going to meet the work test. All right. And then I'll do something about it. So if they'd said what this means for you right now is the end of that sentence would be absolutely nothing. <laughs> it, no, it has no relevance for me whatsoever. So that sort of stuff. And fine. If you have to, if you have to disclose it to me, Put that on the last page, put that in appendix, put that also, by the way, here are the other changes, make it small, make it sort of secondary. What actually was relevant for me? Maybe it was nothing. Maybe they should have said, actually, the budget changes probably don't mean anything for you, but you should really think about consolidating your super because that's the main thing you should do right now or whatever it is. That's probably what they should have said. I love it. And, you know, I was coaching a financial advisor who every year, his licensee would give him the updates from the budget the day after the budget would come out and he'd just send them out. And it's like, you know what? And I'm his client. So I said, this is seriously as boring as all. So what we discussed and what he did in the end was 
he would have, okay, for all of those who want to know all the nitty gritty detail, click this link and it was a link directly to what the license had provided. For those of you who just want to know the snapshot, um, here are the five key changes. For those of you who want, to won the, who want to see who won the voice last night, that singing contest, and know that if anything's going to affect you, I will be in touch, click this link. And it was so beautiful. And obviously I'd um, given him some ideas, but he put all of that together himself. And when I was even the recipient, knowing that was coming, I was so excited. So one, I didn't know who won the voice, so I did get to click on that. But besides the point, what it actually did was make him seem more valuable in my eyes because of the line there that if there is something that's going to affect you directly, I will be in touch. So I then got that reassurance that he's still there looking over me. But I got to smile at the same time. Yeah. And he got so many clients coming back to him after that email. I go, oh, wow, that was really cool. And yeah, I kind of, I'm relying on you. He's never had that level of engagement before, yet all the other advisors were saying, here's the update on the budget, here's the update on the budget. So Yeah, so he's injected a bit of personality in it. And I think in a case of advice, as you, what you described, because he's got that relationship, that sounds like it's, it's, um, it's sort of enhanced the communication. If I was a super fun, though, I reckon they'd be very nervous. So there's a dog barking. <laughs> I, reckon I'd be, I reckon I'd be very nervous to put a bit of humour in, given I don't have that personal relationship. I've got a broad membership base. I don't really know if I'm going to be offending someone or they misinterpreted or if the language is as English as a second language, all that sort of stuff. But I should know things like the person's balance. I should know probably their age. And then I can go and say, you know what, for people who are under the age of 40, who have a low balance, the main thing from the budget is government co-contribution or whatever it was. And then for people who are older, oh, it's the new pension rules. They should know that sort of stuff. And then, it, But it does require a bit of effort to say, now I'm going to send out, instead of one budget update, I'm going to send out four budget updates. And those budget updates will be for these different cohorts. So there's a bit more work in it, but it takes the burden off then the member from saying, what the hell does all this mean for me? Actually, the, the fund has gone, we can help you with that. For you people, this is what it means. And for you people, this is what it means. So a little bit of something in there for everyone that they're going to value, not just the generic broad brush, nothing to do with me. Literally, I'm going to see another email from you. I'm going to delete it before I open it. Yeah, well, there's a whole bunch of things. I mean, A, it looks more valuable because it looks like you've thought about me and you put a bit of effort in, which is which is true. But at scale, you could do this over 100,000, 500,000 clients pretty easily. So there's, there's the value piece. But then there's the, if you look at how is it going to change the way I, whether I read it and whether I action it. So those two things, I'm more likely to read it because it appears personally relevant. I'm more likely to action it because you've just told me the thing that actually is relevant for me that I actually do. So it's led to better outcomes, hopefully the, for the client, for the member as well. They're more likely to do the thing, make the contribution or look at their pension arrangement, whatever it is. So it's like everybody's a winner. So someone has to do a little bit more work, but that work has meant 500,000 people have to do a lot less work. So it's, it's a real benefit, I think, ultimately, if we sort of look at it that way. Oh, I love that. I love it. And that's the theme that you mentioned earlier, that, you know, people value where something takes more effort. Isn't there also, and this you'd know more about this from a behavioural finance point of view, is like if we actually put the furniture together, so you buy the flat pack from IKEA and put it together, those shelves are far more valuable to me than the ones that have been delivered already pre-made. Um, I guess you'd see a lot of that play out too with the same similar kind of thinking. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, as you say, it's the IKEA effect, isn't it? Yeah, that I yeah. value the stuff that I've put together like the like I did from, from IKEA. Yeah, and, and I mean, there's some good research around this that says that sort of thing applies in financial advice or other sort of professional investment or professional sort of relationships that the more that the client contributes to it, the more that it seems to be driven by what they've said and that they've sort of been in actively involved in that conversation, then the more they more the more they value it, the more they're influenced by it. For example, the stickier that relationship is, yeah, all those sorts of things apply. And I think the other thing that goes there is if it's my effort, yes, it's that, that IKEA effect applies, but also it's more transparent. My, my effort, I can see the stuff that I've done in, in contributing to this. But if you were my advisor, I can't necessarily see all the stuff that you've done because you're working away somewhere else. So there's a related concept there, which is saying what I want is operational transparency. I want to see through what you're doing so if I mean if you were working in a restaurant, 
I, I want to be able to see the kitchen, all right? Now I can see all the chefs hard at work making the meal, that sort of thing, versus just the meal arrives on my plate and I don't see, I don't get the, the operational transparency, to see all the stuff that's gone into making that. The fact there were 10 people in the back and they've altered to whatever they're doing. I don't know. I don't know about cooking. Just give me all saying, I'll be fine. <laughs> I can't cook either. So this is another conversation. I'm not going to delve any deeper into the cooking. I, I, when I was at uni, I was waitressing at a steak restaurant and I, it was my first week or two there and somebody orders. Second, one of the things you have to ask them is, how do you like that steak cooked? And someone said, blue. And I thought they were pulling my leg and I giggled and said, oh, yeah, haha, really funny. How do you want it cooked? And they still said blue and they said, go and ask the chef. And I went and said to the chef, someone's pulling my leg. They want a blue steak. They're like, okay. <laughs> there is a thing. Um, yeah, so anyway, yeah, the cooking and I aren't great mates either. Um, I'd love to ask your question, though, between a fine line between making somebody's life easier. I know that going and seeing a professional, one of the kind of the peripheral benefits is that you can make it easier for me to get stuff done versus the value in having some effort of me to contribute to that outcome. So, you know, there's some, some professionals that say, right, I want the client to fill in all this information and send it back to me before I will even meet them because they think it's a sign of their commitment to not only the process but to, to doing this properly, whereas others will say, nah, just come in and from there I'll try and do as much as of the data collection, whatever, as I can. Well, what are your views in that space? Like where's that fine line get drawn? Uh, I don't think it's a line. I think it's a it's a continuing moving, well, maybe the moving line. So the moving line would start off with, I don't want them to do, I want them to do very, very little early on until I've built some trust, I've built some value, the, the idea that there's value in it. And then if I'm going to get them to do something, it's something very small that has an immediate payoff. So I'm, I'm only getting you to do this thing because, hey, look, it's going to help you to do X. I want you to book an appointment because then we can have a conversation. Okay, you happy to book an appointment? All right, that's going to take you 30 seconds to click on this link and choose a time. All right, now you've got me to do something, but it was very clear what the benefit to me was. All right, now what's the next thing? Well, you need to come in or have a Zoom meeting or whatever it is. Okay, what, what will I get out of that? It's going to be X, Y, and Z. All right, now I've committed another 45 minutes of my time or whatever the meeting was for that first one, but I knew what I was getting out. All right, now what's the next thing? It's going to be something bigger than a 45 minutes and, I, and you've had to tell me what the benefit is. Oh, it's filling out this information fact find sort of document and completing my risk profile. What, oh, that's going to take me, what, another hour? And it sounds pretty boring. Why do I have to do that? Well, it's so that I can do blah, 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 because what you've told me is that you need to change your investments or whatever and to do that. So I've, each stage, it's, it's getting bigger. The, the commitments are scaling each time it relates to them getting a benefit. And as soon as they can get the benefit, the faster they can get the benefit, the more tangible that benefit is, then I think the easier it is. But, I agree, but by the time you've been through this process and ultimately I've booked a meeting, had the meeting, booked, done these fact finds, had a subsequent meeting, read a statement of advice, blah, done all those things. Yeah, by the time I'm through all that process, then I've got the benefits of easy at the out, outset, but also a lot of my input through the process. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And that's certainly something that I, you know, when I'm speaking to a lot of advisors, that there's that challenge between how much do I get them to do and when. The other thing that I see too is um, where, say, the client comes in for an annual meeting and the advisor's done a lot of stuff over the last 12 months, but the client kind of sits there and says, well, I haven't seen you for 12 months. I've had a bit of a newsletter, whatever. Uh, I'm paying you three, $5,000, whatever the price is. Um, that's not the point. Um, don't really see the value. And I see advisors that then just want to go, Whoop, but I've done this and I've done this and I've met this person and I've done that and almost show, you know, their task list of all the things they've done. What are your views in that space? Yeah, I mean, it's it, I, I'd want to have that transparency so that we're aware of it. I think it's sounding like at the annual review is not maybe the time, the time to inundate the client with a, a bunch of things when actually the client wants to get something out of that. But having having that process, I mean, I think that's having it in a, say, say a statement of advice, for example, probably actually gives you two things. It gives you one, look at all the stuff I've done, therefore there's value in this. That, that sort of conversation or that sort of mindset in the client, but actually probably helps you to meet your regulatory requirements and demonstrate the basis of your advice anyway. You know what? In recommending this fund, I had to go and review 25 other funds or whatever it was. And looking at your asset allocation, we had to do this, this, and this. We think about your risk profile, think about your cash flow needs, think about your age, think about your investment horizon. We had to think about all those sort of things. We had to incorporate. So I'd, I think it's just a time and a place for all that sort of stuff and maybe incorporating it into a, 
a, I don't know, a, a latter stage part of a, a statement of advice, it's sort of towards the back where you're outlining all this sort of stuff with a summary at the front to say, oh, we've been through this process, refer to page 43 if you want to see all the detail, because there it all is. All right. Uh, yeah, I agree. I wouldn't want to um, get my client in from the annual review and say, listen, client, I've done <laughs> this. I think, yeah, it's, it sounds a bit too much like I'm really trying to sell you something. And the research around that is quite interesting, which is when people feel like they're going to be sold something, so you can nudge somebody, it works. You can do two things, it works. When you do five things, it doesn't work. And actually it backfires because they think, I mean, what's this person trying to do? It seems like they're really trying to push me to do something. Yeah, and then you just get your hackles up and you're going, well, actually, no, I'm not going to do that thing. You're, you're trying to sell me something and trying to con me. I love it. Is there, is there a magic number? So five is too much. Two might not be enough. Is there a uh, kind of think, rule of thumb? I think if from memory it was about three where the, the turning point was. I think one or two was okay. And then it sort of seemed to come up. I didn't have that right in front of me. Um, there was a Robert Cialdini book, I think, that's had some of that research outlined in it. Yeah, from memory, it was about three. Or the power but, of influence or something. Uh, yeah, I think it was the... I think it was the big small, maybe. I don't oh, know. This is okay. from years ago. I can't, yeah. you know, I could be wrong. No, I was just reading something about him this morning. That's also it's very, very timely. Um, and and I, I love I love the power of three. I think there's so many things where the benefit comes in three, three points. I mean, you know, we've got all the, the three little pigs, the, the three bears, all of that kind of jazz. Um, when it comes to value, though, what influence do you think price plays in all of this, Whether it, wherever value plays out? What role does price have in your mind? Uh, well, you may have seen some of this research before, but every time there's vague, every time value is vague, then price effectively is the thing that then gives us a proxy for what the value is. So what happens when you drink a wine? Well, if you enjoy it more if you think the price was higher, uh, for example um the, well the same with advice you are more influenced by advice you have to pay for versus advice that you don't pay for and if it's more expensive then you're more influenced by it um i did write down a couple more of these examples um what's another one uh what else have i got no i can't uh, immediately see it but anyway there's, there's a few of those those sorts of examples i think the other thing that comes with price is the um the, the anchoring effect. So I've I've done this with, I don't know, I, I had I don't know, about 400 or so advisors. I was running a session across just of different groups. I gave them a survey at the, at the outset and said, I asked them something about, well, what do you think is the average value of the fees that uh, people pay for financial services, including advice and tax returns and, I don't know, stockbroking, whatever. Well, how much do you think people pay on average each year for all these things? All right, so these, these were financial advisors, so they should have a better view than your average Joe on the street, you would imagine, but they might not know how many, I mean, they'd have a good view about advice clients, but maybe not about the broader population, then maybe they don't see the stockbroking fees, and how do they know how much they're paying their accountant for tax advice? All right, so there's some uncertainties in this for them, but probably not as much as individual clients. All right, so what I wanted to do was to try and work out how much I could anchor them, change their perceptions by just throwing in a number. Okay, so what I got is, I, I, they gave them all this online survey, but I broke them into two groups. They didn't see this, of course, but they were in two groups. Half of them, I said, do you think it's above or below, I think I said $5,000. Do you think it's above or below $5,000? I wasn't interested in their answer. How much do you think it is? All right, so the $5,000 was effectively an anchor. And was that going to influence? All right, the other half, I think I said from memory, do you, do you think it's above or below $500? Oh, yeah. Well, again, I wasn't interested in their answer. Just wanted to throw that out there as an anchor. How much do you think it is? Okay, so now I have two, these two groups who effectively have both answered the same question. How much do you think the average person pays for these, these fees across the course of a year? Theoretically, it's the same group of advisors with the same question. They should give me the same answer. Did they? Not even close. Miles apart. It was, I don't know, 60% difference or something. It was, it, you know, it was, a, it was, a, it was quite a substantial difference. So the people who had seen the $5,000 number, I forget what their number, they, they said maybe two and a half grand or something. And the people who had seen the lower number, what do they say? I don't know, maybe $1,000 or something, whatever. Anyway, there was, a, there was a massive difference. And that's not a one-off. So I've done that sort of thing previously with, individual clients with with advisors 
just throwing a number in. I use this with my negotiations courses as well. When you're sort of saying, when you're going to negotiate something, make sure there's a, an advantageous anchor in the conversation before you go and negotiate a price if you're buying or selling a business or whatever it is. So that sort of stuff, the price, the price of the service, the price of related services it would make a big difference then because that's, that's the proxy I use for assessing what the value of the thing is. I've got no idea how much this thing is really worth. I buy a house, do I, do I know how much, how do I quantify how many dollars of value I get from sitting on the back porch, reading the newspaper in the sunshine? No idea. But do I know how much the house down the road sold for? Yeah, that's, what, <laughs> that's exactly what I know. Oh, it's such an interesting one. And it's funny, actually, my um, sister-in-law is a real estate advocate. She, she was a real estate agent for 20 years. And she sometimes is running an auction or at an auction and some people will buy a house and they've spent less time looking at it or doing any research than they would when they're buying a mobile phone. And, mm -hmm. you know, the price of the house can be millions of dollars and the mobile phone is quite interesting. So it's interesting, but, but when the price was right and compared to, say, what they've already anchored as a reasonable price for this, suddenly that's enough reason for them to go and buy the property. She's been blown away. Um, mm. by how that works in theory um, but, but and, also, and the advertised so price too versus oh yeah you know how that influences um yeah what the market's willing to pay yeah well you you might want to relate this message to her though because the um there was a bit of research that looked at um i think it was in the u.s real estate agents who were asked to give a professional evaluation of the value of, of a particular property so an independent valuation and they were given a whole bunch of materials about the size of the property, all the stuff that you expect to see if you're looking at a property. <clears throat> and on that basis, can you please give us your professional opinion, independent opinion? And that half of them saw this in material. The other half saw the same set of material, but they had the vendor's expectations in it. So there was a price point in there. Um, and then they were asked, for the people who saw the vendor's expectations, did the vendor's expectations make any difference to your valuation? Oh, no, no, no. You asked for my independent evaluation. I don't care what the vendor wants. That's, that's irrelevant. Did it make a difference? Yeah, it made it. It made a difference. Yeah, you're anchored by anchored by that amount. Yeah. So, so how just if, if someone was say in um, financial advice, how could they use price as an anchor for their benefit? Like, yeah. So I, yeah. I'd be doing two things. I'd, I'd be one is I need to understand what anchor points the client is coming with anyway. So as part of my conversation, I want to know if I'm offering advice for five thousand dollars but the client gets their tax returns done by five for $500. And that's what they're thinking about when they come to visit me, that $500 that they pay for their tax return is gonna influence how they perceive the $5,000 that they pay for, if that's what they're thinking about. So one, one point is I'd, I'd want in my conversations to, to try as best I can to understand what those anchors might be. So it's, we're not starting from a blank slate here. People are gonna come with what some anchors in mind. So we, we have to understand and counter them in, to, some, to some extent. Then I'd want to put anchors in that are advantageous. So uh, this is all on the basis that I'm assuming that the, the client is getting value that exceeds the fee. Otherwise, we're just conning people and misleading them and, 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 um, and that sort of thing. So assuming that I'm, I'm charging them $5,000 and they're getting more than $5,000 of value, but I need to convince them that there's $5,000 worth of value there. All right, so what things should I do? Well, the research around anchors is actually anchors can be very powerful despite them having no relevance whatsoever. All right, so I could, I mean, I theoretically, I could roll dice and go, oh, look, 10. I'm only going to charge you 5,000, though. <laughs> a lot less than the dice. All right, All right. theoretically, I could have that because that's what the research is show, rolling dice, spinning pinwheels, right? like things, last digits of your social security number or the three first digits of your phone number. You know that these things have nothing to do with the price of the kettle or whatever you're being asked to, to evaluate, but they do. However, in the context of an advice relationship, I don't want to be looking silly. <laughs> I say, well, 23 degrees today, but I'm only going to charge you 10,000. <laughs> All right, so, so I want to maintain, obviously, that, that trust relationship. But if I can have things that are, are at least perceived to be relevant. So, uh, well, highly relevant might be, look, this transition to, advice, a transition to retirement advice is going to save you $10,000 of tax over the next three years. My advice fees for that are $3,000 or something. Okay, there's a relevant, that's, that's be a relevant anchor. Okay, fine, that's over three years. Okay, fine, maybe I could have done it myself. Okay, fine, I could maybe got my tax account to do it cheaper, but there's a relevant anchor that makes the $3,000 or whatever it is seem reasonable. But even 
even then that's it doesn't have to be that con- close a connection i would argue which is to say i don't know maybe i'm uh, arranging some life insurance for example or some income protection insurance okay what we're going to do is we're going to give you um should you be unable to work you're going to get 75 percent of your annual salary that works out to one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars a year of salary that you get if you can't work for this $125,000 of salary that you'll be getting, all right, the premiums are only $1,000 a year or whatever. The, okay, so I've set this. Now, should the should that $125,000 number be directly related to the smaller, much smaller premium number? Well, not really, because there's a whole bunch of risk assessments and things that go in there. And I really rationally, I should compare what alternatives there are and whether it's value for money and blah, 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 blah. I should. But we've just used an anchor that has some perceived relevance in this case. It's the tangible benefit in this case as well that the client's going to get. I've positioned that just prior to then saying the fee or the premium or whatever it is that's related to that thing. And therefore, I'm using some of that anchoring effect to make that fee or premium seem smaller. Or more wow. Reasonable. That simple. What did I say? I think that so. I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah. I love well, it. Well, your real estate agent example, I think, I mean, what do they do? They just charge a percentage of the of the. I mean, <laughs> yes, the person's not paying any attention to the value of the property if they're not doing any research compared with a mobile phone. But how much attention they're paying to the twenty grand or whatever it is that they're paying to the real estate agent for putting a sign at the front and managing an auction process? Well, the real estate agent's thinking is wonderful because she's done almost <laughs> nothing and then gets a commission. Like she's thinking it's perfect, so she's loving it. But it was interesting just the psychology behind it. And I'm not a psychologist. That's why I was interested in your view around it. Um, But I went to an auction. I mean, I did a podcast specifically on property, um, uh, the decision-making aspects of property. And as as the research to do that, I went to an auction and I just took my pen and paper and wrote down all the things that they did that lined up with some of these sort of decision-making aspects. And so anchoring, what did they do in the auction? They did it very well. So there's a bidding process. The problem is, of course, the bids might start low. You don't want those things as being low anchors. All right, so what does the auctioneer do? Well, did you know, everybody, the houses around this area often go for 1.8 million. Currently, the bidding's up to 1.1. Who's next? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, things like that. It's like, so constantly, did it, but the bidding stops. Okay, we might be now thinking, well, we're getting close. Let me remind you, everyone, houses around here go for 1.8 million. Okay, reinserting the, the $1.8 million high anchor into it. So now we're at 1.4 or whatever up to, yeah, okay, fine. Now seems smaller again compared with that 1.8 anchor. Yeah, so we can use some of those sort of concepts to influence people's assessments of value. Oh, I love it. Oh, my God, Simon, I could stand here and talk to you forever about this stuff, but uh, I'm sure you've got other clients who need your value right now. Can I just ask you a couple more things? First one is... Of all of the people or the the experts and those who have done their PhDs and all of that in behavioural finance or in psychology, who's your favourite? So it could be Uh, author, it could be a researcher. Who stands out? Uh, well, it depends who the audience is. So a lot of my audience are investment professionals. And if I was looking at the investment professional end, it'd be probably Michael Marbusen. So he would be less familiar to probably the general populace or to advisors I'm imagining, but he's sort of at the more technical end. Um, so I'd probably say him. Uh, otherwise, I mean, the Cialdini stuff is hard to miss from a sort of a general applic- applicability of sort of social psychology. It's less about behavioural finance, but it's more about behavioural economics and some of the sort of psychological principles, but they've got broad applicability. So I'd, yeah, probably go and look for some of his sort of stuff as well. Um, how do you feel Mel Boosen? Malbusen, oh gosh, M A U B O U S I N, maybe. Okay. Michael cool. Malbusen. Michael Malbusen. Okay, cool. That's good. No, I can look that up. Um, the other thing is, do you drink wine? <laughs> I try not to drink too much, but yes. Okay. So if you bought a bottle of wine 10 years ago for $20 and you opened it tonight and it's 10 years later, and if you were to sell it on the market, you'd get $200 for it and you drink it tonight. What's the value of the wine that you're drinking tonight? Is it $20, well, $200 or something else? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, the, the, it, theoretically, I'd say it's $200 if that's the amount that I could then sell it for. Mm-hmm. But if it's a particular wine that I particularly like and I get more than $200 worth of value out of it, arguably it's more than 200 but it's certainly not the 20 no i, I agree and that's 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 a bit like me saying gosh i bought bhp shares for 10 bucks 30 years ago what are they worth now 
they're not worth 10 bucks anymore. <laughs> I can go and sell them on the market for 38 or whatever the price is. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So sorry, you can't trick me into that one. Was that, was that what you were No, no, no. I, um, I did a survey on value earlier this year, and that was one of my questions. And interesting to see 75% of people said that it was $200. Like they're drinking it tonight. It was around 200. 25% of people though said that they were drinking a $20 bottle of wine because that's what they paid for, albeit 10 years ago. If, if um, you don't mind letting me know who those people were, and then I'll buy their wine off them for 20 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. So that was just more um, out of interest than anything else to see how your brain processes alcohol and price and value. Um, and on that note, Simon, if people want to get in touch with you and learn more about the work that you do or just read some of the insights that you share, where would they go? Uh, websites, behavioralfinanceaustralia.com.au or look me up on LinkedIn, Simon Russ. Oh, yeah, all one word, behavioralfinanceaustralia.com.au. It's a bit of a mouthful, but, yeah. And it has a U in it. It's the Australian spelling, not the American spelling. Oh, <laughs> really English. good. And Russell, double R U double S E double L. Yeah, one R, if that's what you meant. R U W S E W. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maths is my forte, not spelling. Um, okay. So, Simon Russell and LinkedIn, and they can go to either of those places to check you out. Um, thank yeah, you I, I so much. 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 This has been so valuable. Like I said, I, I could just pick your brains forever, but um, you've probably got other things to get on with. Pleasure speaking with you. Thank you.